So Emmett Fox does a, a whole uh, discussion on the Our Father, but he breaks it down. And today's card is Thy Kingdom Come, which is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. Man, being manifestation or expression of God, has a limitless destiny before him. His work is to express in concrete, definite form the ideas that God furnishes him. And in order to do this, he must have creative power. Elsewise, he would be merely a machine through which God worked, an automaton. But man, having the nature of his father, remains a creator. Notice that the word individual means undivided. The consciousness of man and woman is not separated from God's consciousness. Thy kingdom come means that it is our duty to bring more and more of God's ideas into concrete manifestation upon this plane. That is what we are here for. The old saying, God has a plan for every person, and he has one for you, is quite correct. If only you can find out the thing God intends you to do and will do it, you will find that all doors will open to you, and you will be gloriously happy. There is a true place in life for each one of us where we can bring the kingdom of God into manifestation and truly say, Thy kingdom come. I want to kick the talk off. The title is Unifying Silence. And I want to kick it off by repeating part of what she just read. The consciousness of man and woman is not separated from God's consciousness. And yet, here we on, are on this earth living very fractured lives. You know, we intellectually, at least in this congregation, this community, understand that we are too much separated from the divine. And yet, just by being here, trying to live, we are distracted from the connection, if we can put it that way. Um, some, oh gosh, four or five years ago, there was an Easter event at one of the local churches that Phyllis and I participated in, uh, where there were various stations where there was people saying, or you did something. And one of them, we were to have some quiet meditation. And the church minister was leading us station to station. And when we got to the station for the quiet, he sat down, we all sat down. And just as Phyllis and I were getting into our quiet, he got up ready to go to the next station. It hadn't been more than a couple or three minutes. Um, not a person, I'd say, who was comfortable with silence. Um, the Buddhists talk about three aspects of our being here, uh, the body, the speech, and the mind. Um, Father Rohr, Richard Rohr, you know that I refer to him often because so much of what he believes fits what I think most of us do. In describing our uh, non-silent centered lives uh, says, quote, I call non-silence dualistic thinking where everything is separated into opposites like good and bad, life and death. And in the West, he goes on, we even believe that is what it means to be educated, to be very good at dualistic thinking. Join the debate club. But both Jesus and Buddha would call that judgmental thinking. And they strongly warn us against it. And he refers us to Matthew 7. Unifying silence is where we want to be. And I want to talk a bit about that. Richard Rohr talks about it as contemplative silence or contemplation. Uh, but wherever he uses that, I'm going to use the word unifying silence because that's what means most to me as we talk about it. Um, he's, he, he goes on in his writing to say, dualistic thinking is an operative most all the time. It is when we choose or prefer one side 
and then call the other side of the equation false or wrong or heresy or untrue. But what we judge as wrong is often something to which we have not been exposed or that somehow we feel threatened by. The dualistic mind splits the moment and forbids the dark side, the mysterious, the paradoxical from being acceptable to us. It is the common level of conversation that we experience these days in much of religion and much of politics. And unfortunately, even in everyday conversation, I have read so many times in the agony columns I read just recently, my neighbor has become full-blown Trump. And every time we talk, she wants to lecture me on how wrong everybody else is. How do I deal with it? The loss of the sense of community, the distraction by judgmental or dualistic thinking would be the way I would put it. And he points out that such dualism, such I'm okay, you're not okay, lacks humility and patience. And it is the opposite of unifying silence or contemplation. He says, in unifying silence, the Holy Spirit frees us from taking sides and allows us to remain content long enough for the Spirit to teach, broaden, and enrich us. And regardless of how we practice, because of course there's drumming, there's stillness, there's an observation of breath, there's chanting. I read an article by someone who took a four week course or two week, where for 11 hours a day you sat cross legged counting your breath until finally your feelings, your thoughts came and went, even your hunger for food went. Um, when you are in the unifying silence, all the physical gets pulled into question you know, what we call thinking, we realize it doesn't enable us to love God, love others. Thinking, we might say, is inimical to divine love. And Rohr points out that we need a different operating system, a system united with God, whole, where we're whole within ourselves, a system where unifying silence begins our existence and continues through our existence. It's like when we enter silence, this unifying silence, all the disparate parts of who we are as we inhabit this body, live on this earth, are subsumed by the perfect presence, the loving presence, which is the divine. And is us as children with the spark of divine within us. It can give us a sense of solidity, uh, a way of existence where we can reside with wholeness within, as opposed to in the dualism. And I use dualism with some hesitation, the dualistic thinking, because there's usually more than yes or no. Uh, if you're moving away from pure dualistic thinking, a little more toward uh, the amorphousness of divine existence, there's multiple choices for any particular situation that you have. But within the solidity, it's like we find the silence between the words, the silence between each experience, each action, a silence that adds beauty, adds meaning, adds peace, much more than just the words themselves or in place of the words themselves. And at some point we can get to the point where the words just can melt, melt away and we can exist lovingly in this silence 
uh, we might even consider that the words that are stuck in the silence, like raisins in a pudding, um, as we're in this unifying silence, we understand, can come to understand that the words demonstrate the limits of our human capacity to connect with and absorb divine love, divine understanding. So with this initial conversation, let me share with you how unity defines metaphysical silence. A state of consciousness entered into for the purpose of putting man in touch with divine mind so that the soul may listen to that still small voice. Now remember, Quakers talk about the still small voice that we listen, that spark of God within each of us. And then the unity definition goes on. When one goes into the silence, he, they, let's move it to more modern language. They enter the secret place of the most high, the closet of prayer within. They close the door and in the stillness of that meeting place, that's where they pray to God, where they commune with God, God communes with them, where they meditate on truth in the divine. And then in this process, each of us in this secret place of the most high, listen for what God has to impart to us. And often enough, it's not in words, just like the unifying silence is not words, it's between the words. Uh, Richard Rohr again, silence needs to be understood in a larger way than simply the lack of audible noise. Whenever emptiness, what may seem to us as empty space or the absence of sound becomes its own fullness with its own kind of sweet voice, we have moved, we are now experiencing the full glory of sacred silence. Now, because our community accepts silence as part of our spiritual walk, it is most likely that each of us at some point or other has experienced for at least a moment or four, this deep, deep divine silence, unifying silence. And our task before us is to feed this divine silence, free it, allow it to become part of this brilliant, still small voice, this brilliant inner light within us. Uh, we might say that it's not that we hear silence, but it is in the silence that we hear that we can come to knowing. Um, you know, it's, the silence is not something we can capture, though there is a great deal to be said for observing the practice of unceasing prayer, and we might think of it as unceasing silence. We do not need to fill our mind, Holy Father, have mercy on me, a sinner, etc. We can have that conversation by maintaining the unifying silence. And that silence can undergird us as we walk through this life, making choices in this life, seeking to do as the divine would have us in this life. We might think of it as Silence being a kind of thinking that is not thinking. It is a kind of thinking which truly sees, or I might say, truly understands. It is, if you want to think of it this way, an alternative consciousness. And as you are more and more able to walk in this alternative consciousness, in this divine unifying silence, it will manifest itself 
in how you walk through this world. Now, the Quakers, the Amish, all of whom prize in one way or another a sense of internal divine silence when you meet them, or at least as I've met them and gotten to know them, there is a solidity of peace that radiates from each of them. I can't explain the experience, but I've seen it and it means so much when I experience that coming from someone. And I certainly hope in my walk that I at some point get to the point where I can radiate that eternal, divine, undualistic love. Your whole behaviors will change. Um, interesting, the Muslims have some, some conversation about that, about silence and its effect on us. Um, the, they, they recognize the difference between living in the fleshly interest of what Sister Pepper used to call our carnal being, our fleshly being, and the spiritual life. Um, one of the great leaders in Islam, and I do not know who wrote this, um, Imam Ali bin Abi Tali, and I've heard of him. You know, he is a major teacher from way back when. Uh, had said at some point, someone who speaks less or less often actually embodies more wisdom. And a, a modern teacher in Chicago says, one of, uh, one of my teachers once told me that as a people, we need to learn the art of silence like we learn the art of communication. And I can think in my own life of three or four people where what you saw was the silence first, a quiet silence. And people who needed the chatter were uncomfortable around them. Let's be clear, unifying silence doesn't just change your external behavior you're going to find that your internal being, your internal self disputes, self doubts, they find their place. You might say they get taken over by the unifying silence. Unifying silence is liberating. Um, the earthly habits, worry, uh, dispute, tend to lose their attachment to you. And if we want to think of our travel through this life as sort of struggling to balance all the conflicting pulls and beliefs and needs, then the practice of unifying silence can serve as a safety net for us uh, or a balance pole as we walk down this tightrope of life, not wanting to fall too much this way or too much this way. And as you learn to comfortably live in this silence, where your fractured earthly parts cease to create distraction, confusion in you, then you become, you live more and more the simplicity of a loving, God-directed life, where your experience of life and the experience of those who know you is of divine love, divine joy. And you will know where to walk, how to walk without intellectually knowing, if you will. Uh, ultimately, as each of us continues our practice of unifying silence, it will become ever present, more and more ever present. We will find this joyous, divine, enriching, unifying silence surrounding us, enfolding us, enriching us in the spirit and in the divine 
where we will ultimately be going to join when it's our time to leave here. You'll find yourself becoming increasingly coherent with divine flow. You won't be fretting so much who you are or what to do next as you exist here because it will flow. You are in the flow. The unifying silence is the divine flow. And you will be more and more aware that there's an underlying goodness that holds everything in a warm embrace. And the more you are able to live in this universe, unifying silence, the more you're going to live and experience this goodness in the very depths of your being, the very depths of your spiritual walk. So I want to return to the Emmett Fox reading. You simply are. Your true place is the one place where we can bring the kingdom of God into manifestation and truly say, thy kingdom comes. That is the power of unifying silence. That is it can be the goal for you as you walk through this earth to be a manifester of the kingdom coming to those who have not yet been able to learn it or absorb it themselves. Dear God, we thank you for having brought us together. We thank you for guiding us and having guided us so that we are closer to you now than we were last week. For helping us learn lessons so we can move closer to you and also bring more good to this universe. We thank you for this time together, this time for sharing, for caring. We thank you for watching over us as we seek to do your good and carry out the best of our, we can of our lives this week. Help us to know when to speak and how to speak in love and to know who is hurting and how we can help them heal. Thank you for giving us new understandings this week that we can bring back to share here and thank you for watching over not only us, but those we love and we care for. We thank you for all this good, dear God. All the healings that are coming into place, all the healings and good you bring to us. And we thank you for having enabled us to find the faith in you. That we actually know that all things do work for good when we claim it that way. Thank you, dear God, for that faith. Amen. Amen.